Hello and a warm welcome to Mr M for Chem YouTube channel. I hope it finds you well and in good spirits. Today we're going to be having a look at Chemistry Paper 6 Alternative to Practical. Before we do, please smash that subscribe button down at the bottom. Much appreciated. Thank you for showing your appreciation. Right, let's move on. We always start, we always start at the beginning with quite an easy question. It asks you to know your apparatus. If you already know your apparatus, perhaps go forward about five minutes. Um, because you're already good, right? Okay, measuring cylinder. Clearly see, you can either use it vertically or you can spin it upside down, stick it in a trough of water and we can use it to collect our gas. So we could have a chemical reaction, maybe acid and metal or acid and carbonate. We are bubbling up our gas into the water, it displaces the water, and here is the volume of the gas that we have produced. Alternatively, we can look in the measuring cylinder, and don't forget, if I enlarge that, we have to look at the bottom of the meniscus to get the full accurate volume of what we are measuring. So uses is volumes of gas or of liquid. A conical flask uh, often comes up in a how do you do a titration question. Is angled as such, normally we have the burette dropping our liquid into it to do the titration. We wait for the indicator to change colour and when it changes colour that's the end point of the titration. So a conical flask is used in titrations. A volumetric pipette, forgive my terrible art on this one, a volumetric pipette can be a range of volumes. It tends to be 25.0 cm cubed and that's again for titrations for measuring accurate, accurate volumes of liquids. A volumetric flask can be used to make a standard solution. There we go. Oh my art is getting a bit better. Um, can be used to make a standard solution. And we fill our liquid up to, again, the same as with the measuring cylinder, the same as with the meniscus on the volumetric pipette, up to the brown line, the same on the volumetric flask. There is, if I just enlarge here, and we have the meniscus surface tension popping us up at the edges, just touching the brown line. Again, it's for accurate solution. Could be a primary standard, um, but for accurate making of solutions. A burette, I've already mentioned, has a tap on the side, a nozzle at the bottom, and it has a scale in 0 0.1 centimetre cubed divisions. So for GCSE, you should be quoting all uh, results, whether it's start or end volume, to one decimal place. For instance, 26.2 cm cubed. This is for accurate. Accurate means close to the true value dispensing of liquids again in a titration. The gas syringe is a wonderful thing if it doesn't roll off the bench. It uh, um, has a plunger which goes into a barrel, has a nozzle on the end and if you connect it to a tube, which is connected to a chemical reaction which is generating gas, goes into the tube, pushes the plunger back here and this is the volume of gas which is given off. So this is for accurate gas volume measurement. There are some more that we need to know. So I have a condenser. Typically it will give you a condenser, a beautiful drawing, just like Mr. Mitchell, and ask you to label where the water goes in. The water goes in at the bottom and out at the top because the water must circulate uphill because it's for cooling vapour into a liquid. Because you're heating the vapour, heating the, the, the liquid, probably a distillation. The liquid is vaporising, the vapour goes up into the condenser, is cooled by the running water and the uh, temperature drops and therefore at lower temperature the uh, intermolecular forces of attraction bring it together into being a liquid. Evaporating basin, easy. What do we put in an evaporating basin? We put the solution is to obtain the solute. Evaporate the solution, solvent comes off, 
and you're left behind with a solute. The crucible and lid tends to be, it is a heating, accurate heating you could say, it tends to be magnesium, could be decomposition, say calcium carbonate, calcium oxide and CO2. Uh, the magnesium is always a pain to get going, then all of a sudden it goes boom, and up it goes, you've got magnesium oxide. Uh, delicious, as some YouTube channels would say. Here we have pestle and mortar, oh my gosh, totally out of uh, <laughs> calibration, pestle and mortar. So this is the cute thing with this, so if you've got a big particle, that means it has a small surface area. If you have small particles, the converse is true. So small plus, so this makes large into small, so go from our big bricks into little bits of dust. Okay. A balance. Balance are always fascinating to students. Cause why? Because you don't tend to have them at home. It has a reading here. It could be in a range 0 to 200 G. It might be to 0 0.1 G or 0 0.01 G. So this is for massing clearly solids. You can actually do liquids on the top as well. You always struggle with gases. <laughs> uh, gauze and a mat. Why am I including these? It's so simple. Because students in exams, they get stressed, bless them, and they rush and they get it the wrong way around. And this is for safe heating. And safety is always a consideration when we are doing practicals. It will sometimes say on the mark scheme, it's not enough to put wear safety glasses. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. So it's best to be completely unequivocal in what you are saying. So let's see. Chemical splash. We want to say goggles and a lab coat. It's playing now. Corrosives, goggles, lab coat, and maybe have a neutralizing agent as well to neutralize any of the corrosive stuff which has been uh, dragged off. What color should we go for? Green. Hot solution, clearly use tongs, those metal things that you use to pick things up. Flammable solvents can use a water bath so we're not putting a flame onto the bottom of our flammable solvents. Water bath is a beautiful ex uh, excursion in pastels. Glassware, good laboratory practice. That's a great thing to write. Write good laboratory practice. It says what uh, safety considerations should you consider. Just, you know, be sensible. <laughs> be sensible. It's on the mark scheme. And gases, the only other thing is we have a fume cupboard. So there's a fume cupboard, safety glasses, gloves, you could say goggles, lab coat, and good laboratory practice. Those six things will get you through any question on safety. Right, reading scales, we were the next thing. Now here's a burette. What do we notice about the burette? It's a beautiful thing. The burette is beautiful, why? Because it gives us accurate volume dispensing. You remembered that from earlier on in the video, right? And this here is an illustration of something called parallax error, where if you put your eye down here, you'd see 19.82. If your eye is too high and not perpendicular to the scale, you see 19.62. But the accurate true reading is this one, which is 19.7. The reason I've included this is because this is a burette. And you'd be thinking, why is he saying that? Well, it's a burette, why? Because at the top, this number 18 is lower than 21, and 21 is higher than 18. So if I were to take that back, that would be 0, 0.0 cm cubed at the top, and 50.0 cm cubed at the bottom. Everybody happy? Of course we are. It's a burette. So why or why, when we are doing, looking at the exams, do they do this? Instead of going 18 to 21, it goes... 18 to 16, so the number decreases. And I've asked a number of my chemistry teacher friends, yes, I have them, why have they done this? And they went, hmm, <laughs> which is what most students do. So this could be 17.1 or 18.9. Hmm. And this could be 25.5 or 26.5. So which one is it? Well, I checked the mark scheme and that's wrong and that's wrong. But the scale's upside down, so the burette will be upside down. So they've drawn a burette as a measuring cylinder, is my contention. And this must be the solution, because 
is darker than the surroundings. This is clearly air. So this must be air. So I suggest to the exam board, you could have put measuring cylinder there, and that would have not confused the students. Just my, just my two pennies on that one. Thermometer, reading scales. There they are. I'm just going to write them on. I might witter away. I do tend to witter away. So is that 28 or 22? It's 22, 24, 26. So oh, it's going up. I'm thinking temperature's increasing. Now they've slid the scale up a bit. Look, be careful. A bit cheeky there. 30 there. 30. Oh, it's stabilized. 29, 28. Oh, it's dropping down. 27 and 26. And they'll probably ask you to draw a graph. And it's going to go up and then it's going to go down, isn't it? Is that all they're going to do? No. <laughs> Ask you to plot a graph, join the points, identify any anomalies, and talk about any trends. The measuring cylinder, what have they done here? What they've done is they've turned it upside down, look, because the base is at the top. So this again, we know the exam board now, the uh, darker bit is the liquid. So this is zero cm cubed. This is 11, 12, 13, 22, 30, 36, 40, 1, 2, 3, and 49. I am wearing my glasses. Hopefully, I got those correct. Mm, we shall see. Writing down the data, then plotting the graph, is the way that every paper six will go. They will probably give you this sort of data, give you a nice line, we've got volume in cm cubed, apologies for the opacity of this image, time in seconds, over time we reach the end of the reaction and we are at constant volume, so the reaction has stopped. They could then ask you, and they often do ask you, what would happen if I decreased A, the temperature, B, the concentration, or C, increased the particle size, don't forget the particle size, the other way around. If we decrease it's going to be less steep at the beginning, less steep, but it's going to finish at the same point, assuming there's no limiting reactant problem. The converse is true. If we do it at higher concentration, higher temperature, it'll be more steep, or the gradient will be greater. And for those students wanting to have their um, full nine points, or A star, you would put a ruler on here, and then you would draw your tangent for the fastest one, and draw your tangent for your original one, and you would draw the tangent for the least concentrated or lower temperature one. Beautiful. I'm very happy now because it's the first time I've ever used that uh, piece of equipment on a YouTube, YouTube video, and I can clearly see that the gradient here is greater, getting less, and getting less. Rise over run. Brilliant. Thank you, iPad Pro. Averaging data, you can all do that. Add them together, divide by the number of data points that there are. So you have 10 cm cubed and 12 cm cubed. 10 out of 12 is 22. Two data points, 22 over 2 is 11. There's nothing more difficult than that. They could give you an anomaly to do. So it could give you some spurious data. Just put a circle around it, call it an anomaly. It's all good. Predictions. Predictions are those higher level thinking skills. That's where the top grades are, which is what we've just been doing. Um, you could calculate the rate. So you could do y over x for each of these, whatever it happens to be on here and on here. Um, that tends to be the single award, not for the uh, double award. If that's your gig. Knock yourself out. It will then go on and ask you to plan an investigation. It could ask you to plan to make I don't know, a sample of potassium sulfate from an appropriate acid and alkali. This one is from a previous paper, and what it's asking me to do is use appropriate apparatus to carry out a titration. So, to carry out a titration, yes, minimize, thank you. What I do is I will, first of all, I know I need my white tile for titrations, so I can see the end point. I've used the white tile. I'm then going to pop my conical flask, you see where this is going, onto my white tile. I'm going to take my pipette, terrible art, Mr. Mitchell, honestly, with the bulb, bulb filler. It's an impressionist bulb filler. And I'm going to take, now what do I have? I have unknown A and unknown B for hydrochloric acid. 
and I have known sodium hydroxide. So I'm going to take my known sodium hydroxide and I'm going to pipette uh, 25 cm cubed and pop it into my conical flask. So I've used this one, this one, and oh, there's a burette. So let's get our burette. Again, impressionist here, and we're going to fill it with our unknown at the top. First of all, with A, and fill this with A. Now I've added my sodium hydroxide plus my indicator at the end point. It will turn, well, this one's turn a shade of yellow. Um, if I'd have been sensible, it would turn a shade of pink because sodium hydroxide would turn phenolphthalein pink. Okay, record the end point, do the mole calculation, and you can work out the unknown concentration. I do have a video on my channel about mole calculations. Feel free to have a look at that in the GCSE playlist. Have I used everything? I've used the indicator, the burette, all these. I use A, R, and next I need to do it with B. So first A, then B. Did I get six marks? Yes, and so will you. The big problem with the paper six is this, the chemical tests. Why is it such a problem? Because there are so many of them. There's, there's just a full page of them. Some dissolve in excess, some don't. Some are green, some are blue, some are brown, some are red. It's just, oh, there's so much. What could we possibly do to learn the chemical tests? Well, you could do this. There's a crazy guy on the right-hand side of this slide. If you go to my channel, and I may well just pop it up here for you to click on to watch how to do the chemical tests. Because knowing how to test the nitrate, sulfate, chloride, how to test the gases, chlorine, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, um, how to do anion tests, cation tests, metal tests, there's only one way to learn this, and that's to spend some time, do the hard graph, and learn them. To help you, I've created this chemical test video with lots of sparkly things across it. Okay, thank you so much for watching. Remember, smash that subscribe button. It could be there, it could be there. Depends where I put the video of me talking.